this BioBasics lecture. I have some people I want to thank, first of all, and that's the Research Administrators Campus Committee, the development staff, the Office of Research Administration, and I want to uh, provide special thanks to Dion and Rosalie, who organized this and got all this good news today, so we appreciate that. We have a terrific, terrific speaker today, Dr. Arlene Brown. Uh, previously, we had Stephen Dubinette, who's the PI of the Clinical Translational Science Institute, come and speak to us, and there was such overwhelming interest in his presentation that we were asked to invite another member of the CTSI to come and talk. And so, Dion just told me that we had chased after Dr. Brown for quite a long time until <laughs> no. we could find an opening in her calendar, and so we're very, very grateful that she's here today. She did her undergraduate research at Harvard. She then went to UCSF to medical school and internship and residency. She came to UCLA and was a member of our own STAR program and received her PhD. She has many, many high profile publications and grants in her area of interest, which is diabetes and other chronic medical conditions in underserved populations. She's a, a remarkable star on our faculty, and we're really grateful to hear from her today. So, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you all. Um, I really appreciate being invited. I was able to watch a few of them, and I was very impressed by them, and I'm, I'm actually a little humbled to be asked to, to do this. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, community engagement and translational research. Uh, I'm presenting this on behalf of the CTSI and our community engagement and research, research program, which I co-direct with Keith Norris. So, um, uh, just a broad overview of what I'm going to be discussing today. First of all, I'm going to be talking about translational research and the challenge of improving the health of the public. Um, and then talk a little bit about health risk and health status in Los Angeles County. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how the CTSI is focusing on this area, particularly within the context of the Community Engagement and Research Program, and give you some examples of the types of projects that we're working on to really work on uh, true translational research that involves community and community stakeholders. So, um, just a little backdrop to this. Um, you know, about around 2000, uh, the uh, NIH uh, was actually, and the Institute of Medicine uh, put out a report that uh, focused on the fact that despite the fact that um, there was uh, there's increasing healthcare costs and, and research costs um, were skyrocketing, uh, these were not resulting in better health outcomes for the general population. And there was a big push to think about linkages and communication and the disconnects between research and clinical practice, but between those two as well and community stakeholders. Um, it was clear that research advances were not producing better health care or better health and that the research was not informed by the priorities of communities or community stakeholders. The NIH roadmap, which resulted from this, was an initiative to strengthen translational research um, with an emphasis on really improving health outcomes. So, translational research, it's a term that we throw around a lot, and there are many, many different ways to, to describe this and to think about this. But basically, it's the connection between laboratory research, clinical research, and getting that research to the community and to the clinical settings where it can actually be used. Um, what we were finding is that on average, this took 10 to 25 years, with an average about, of about 17 years to go from discovery to actually widespread use. So, and why was this? I think part of it is really in the types of translation that we're, we're talking about. So, T1 translation, um, is, can be described as that going from bench to bedside, and then T2 translation goes from clinical research or bedside out to community settings, and those community settings may be quite heterogeneous. So, um, lab, the T1 translation occurs in these controlled environments where you have highly selected research, quote unquote, subjects. And, you know, those subjects you can actually be, you can be working with cells, you can be working with mice, you can be working with people, but it's a very, very controlled environment. Um, T2 translation occurs in something resembling the real world, so in community clinics, in public health systems, in very diverse neighborhoods. Um, the goals are actually somewhat different as well. 
you know, T1 translation, um, the goal is to develop new knowledge to prevent, diagnose, or treat disease. It often ends at the point of new drug or procedure or the development of a new drug or a new procedure or a new technique. Um, on the other hand, T2 translation starts with a new therapy or more frequently an existing evidence-based therapy that's being inadequately used. Um, the key goals there are sustainability, dissemination, and spread of effective and efficacious therapies. Um, and then how the work happens, as I said before, in T1 it's in a controlled clinical or behavioral trial in, a, in many uh, instances. In T2, um, the goals, the, it happens in, with using strategies to reorganize and coordinate care, um, to support patient and clinician interactions, and to help individuals engage in healthy behaviors. So, so the goals are quite different, and too often they weren't integrated in any way, shape, or form. Now, translational research, actually, the challenges um, in translational research are in some ways embodied in Los Angeles County. Um, but so, are the, so is the promise of translational research. As you know, LA is enormous. There are 10 million residents in over 4,000 square miles. There's also huge racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity, with 35% of residents speaking a language other than English at home. And you also have sizable subpopulations who are underrepresented in all phases of research. There are also very high rates of preventable, highly preventable chronic conditions in some cases. Um, among adults, 21% are obese, nearly 9% have been diagnosed with diabetes, 25% with hypertension, 8% with heart disease, and 13% with depression. And then among the children, you have this ticking time bomb of, of almost a quarter of kids in Los Angeles County being obese. Um, and then this is all seen in the context of a very robust basic science, clinical, and health services research enterprise that spans several universities and health systems. The problem is no one's really talking to each other, so things do truly get lost in translation. Um, the, this is actually, this slide represents, I think, one of the big motivators behind the strategies being used by RCTSI. This came out in 2010. It was published by the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. And it's the leading causes of premature death in LA County. And as you can see, most of these are preventable. So it also, I also show here both for men and for women, but the, it's, they're, the lists are quite similar, as you can see, though the order is different and the magnitude is different. But it looks at, you look at years of life lost. And as you can see, for coronary heart disease, among men, it's 46,000 years of life lost. Um, to homicide and motor vehicle accidents, it's 65,000. Um, then you look at, just, you just go down the list. For women, it's, uh, s uh, smaller numbers, but still staggering. There's also a lot of heterogeneity in terms of um, life expectancy and years of life lost. Uh, by geography and by race and gender. So if you look in throughout LA County, um, uh, the highest life expectancy is seen in La Cañada Flintridge, the lowest in South Los Angeles. And the difference is over 12 years. Um, by race and gender, for Asian and Pacific Islander women, the um, life expectancy is almost 87 years. For African American men, it's less than 70 years, with a difference of more than 17 years. Um, so this, I think, really was a wake-up call to many of us who've been um, in, the, in the academic environment for a very long time to see the actual consequences of the lack of connection between what we know works and um, health outcomes that are just not budging the way they should be. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned before, is that the leading causes of premature death in LA, among those, most of them are preventable. There are very well-documented evidence-based prevention strategies and or treatments to prevent complications for these conditions. And things so for chronic conditions, heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, stroke, and cancers. There are highly efficacious treatments for many of these conditions. And for diabetes and heart disease uh, and stroke, uh, we know that many things contribute to prevention. Mental health and substance abuse, again, very well-documented evidence-based strategies to reduce um, poor outcomes, to reduce, to reduce the incidence and poor outcomes, and similarly, violence and uh, homicide motor vehicle accidents. So the translational research challenges that I think we all need to think about um, include questions like, are we really making a difference in the health of the community? 
are we addressing the right problems? And are we successfully applying the research that's been shown to work um, in the places where it's needed? And unfortunately, too often, the answers to these questions are no or not really. So this slide sort of adds another element to the translational uh, research paradigm. So going from laboratory research to community, but also an arrow that connects these two. And it's really this community piece that has been explored, I think, um, very effectively by a lot of investigators here at UCLA and within our CTSI. We're really trying to um, expand on the, the notion of connections between the community and the academic infrastructure. So now there are several, as I said before, there are many reasons for using community engagement to try to improve health outcomes. Um, uh, and in addition to the ones I've mentioned, I think there are a few other things that we really should highlight. One is that um, real world interventions that, prove, that do prove successful. So even when you have an intervention that you uh, um, apply in a community setting, they're often difficult to sustain beyond the duration of research funding, often because they are conducted under optimal conditions. So they are the highly selected group of participants, very motivated um, in, in uh, settings where they have access to a lot of resources. And that is not, uh, that's unfortunately not the real world of many patients and many residents of LA County. Um, but using community engagement actually may enhance buy-in from individuals and groups across the, the translation sp translational spectrum at an early enough stage so that you can identify um, the types of things that are sustainable um, and that, that uh, once funding is gone or once um, the intervention, um, the full-scale intervention is withdrawn, can actually continue. Um, Community-engaged methods may also be well-suited to promoting physical, social, and policy environments that enhance self-management, which is a critical component of a lot of the, the disease and, and functional outcome disparities that we see. Um, they also, um, these are environments that also will integrate clinical care strategies with self-care, which too often is, is uh, disconnected, improve quality of care, and that can be sustained and spread. Now, what is community-engaged research? I know many of you in this audience know it well, um, but, and there are many, many, many definitions. But this is one from the Kellogg Foundation that is, I find particularly helpful. It's a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all partners in the research process. And it recognizes that they aren't bringing the same thing, but they're bring, they have unique strengths that need to be built upon. Um, it often, it has to start with a research topic that's of importance to the community, to the stakeholders, and it combines knowledge with action. So it's not like you get this knowledge and then sit on it for decades, but you really need to say, what are you going to do with what you learn? And, and that includes the things that you learn that may say, this doesn't work. So rather than, you know, acting as if, oh, if we just keep, keep researching, we'll find more, you know, we'll find something. It's really saying, this isn't working. How do we change what we're trying to do so that we can get something that works? Um, and then long term, a goal is to achieve social change in order to improve health outcomes and long term eliminate some of the health disparities that are so evident throughout our county, throughout our country. So this is the typical approach to research. A researcher comes up with a problem and the communities and stakeholders are acted upon by the research. So you become your subjects in the research. This is the more equitable version of this paradigm where there is uh, the, um, the community, the stakeholders are seen as research participants and collaborators. So rather than being a subject of, a research, of the research, you're a participant in it. Um, this is uh, by an investigator at Duke, and it just sort of highlights the differences between the traditional research net framework and what we consider true community partner research. And what I like about this is it, it shows the spectrum of, of partnerships. Not every project is going to be a fully community partnered project. That's, that's not possible. But incorporating elements of partnership into research projects is really critical in order to get the best outcome and to get an outcome that actually will be, will really truly be a benefit to the people it's intended for. So 
Instead of the researcher identifying a problem, it's the community that identifies the problem. Um, research is conducted with the community. Um, the community and stakeholders are collaborators. The organizations are partners. Um, and then a critical element of community-engaged research is building community capacity to ask the questions and to, in many cases, answer the questions independently. Um, or ask the questions in collaboration, but with that, the community or the stakeholders actually taking the lead. Um, uh, and then there's really the other thing that is very hard for investigators to do, I know personally this is difficult, where researchers and community share control of the data. Um, it's very easy for us to think, this is my data, I did all this work to collect it, but this is really shared data. And I'll, I'll um, highlight some places where there's actually true sharing of data and true sharing of the analyses. So this is actually um, taken, these are uh, some principles around community, conducting community-partnered um, participatory research. This is from a JAMA paper that was led by Loretta Jones and Ken Wells. And uh, Loretta Jones heads up Healthy African American Families, a community-based organization. Ken Wells is a, is a psychiatrist here at UCLA. So the first thing, as we mentioned before, identify a health issue that fits community priorities and the academic capacity to respond. Not all questions meet that criterion. And I think it's critical for everyone to recognize that. There may be goals that community partners have that are not feasible for a research project, don't make sense within the context of a research project. And there may be um, things that the academic partners just can't do, um, even though they may come to the partnership thinking they're cap fully capable of engaging. The, other th the next step is really to develop a coalition of stakeholders, community, pol from the policy world, from the academic world, that really is a group that's willing to inform, support, share, and use the products. Um, another uh, really important element, and I've seen the importance of this over time, is engaging the community through conferences and workshops that provide information and determine the readiness of people within the community, groups within the community, to proceed, but also to obtain input. There has to be give and take, and if that's not, that you, if folks aren't at that stage, then you have to take a step back. Um, and then once you've identified a common goal, stakeholders who are able to um, act on that goal, um, and you can then think about developing work groups that, that take on different tasks, different components of the research. So they really develop, implement, and evaluate the action plans in real time. And then finally, making sure, and this is one of the things that we often do very early on, is establishing advisory or oversight groups, um, groups that contribute to data analysis, to interpretation and dissemination. So, you know, not everyone in the community is going to be able to run a, a multivariate regression or, you know, do qual a qualitative research analysis of focus groups, but um, the thing that I think is so critical to having community partners at the table for is the interpretation of that data and to think about what it really means. There's such a difference from my saying, oh, this is what this, this is a story that the data tell. Um, and when I, when I present the same data to community partners, they'll say, no, that's not what it means. Here's what I think it means. And there's often so much truth, so much more truth in the community partner's interpretation um, and things that I never saw or never thought about come out once we have that discussion. So, you know, as investigators, we have to be really willing to have that discussion. So I'm going to switch now to talking a little bit about the CTSI, um, uh, what our goals are, and then what uh, the Community Engagement Corps in particular has done and is doing. So um, despite, uh, with all that background, the CTSI decided to move on this vision of enhancing the health of the of residents of Los Angeles County. Um, and the goals, the, uh, the way to achieve that is by speeding translation of laboratory discoveries into treatments for patients engaging communities in clinical research efforts, and really training a new generation of clinical and translational investigators who can, can think about research in a very different way and can work with communities in a very different way. So uh, this is much more detail than you need, but the CTSI is headed by Steve Dubinet, and he leads nine program areas. Um, they include biostatistics, clinical research, um, uh, pilot funding, regulatory and ethics, 
biomedical informatics, translational technologies, um, education and career development, and maternal, child, and adolescent health, and in addition to us, um, the community engagement and research program. And there's the expectation that there are interactions between all those groups, because education has very strong linkages to the community engagement core, as does the clinical research core. We've also got very close linkages with biostatistics. Um, so our aims within the community engagement and research program are to support two-way knowledge sharing, so bi-directional knowledge exchange between community and academ academia, um, to strengthen the infrastructure in both settings for sustainable partnered research, um, to drive innovation in research that accelerates both the volume and the impact of partnered research in diverse communities, and then to use health services research methods to accelerate the design, production, and adoption, widespread adoption, of evidence-based practice and behaviors. Um, we are comprised of essentially three units. So we've got um, community partners, um, a large, uh, large number of community-based organizations, safety net and community clinics, the Los Angeles County Departments of Public Health and Health Services, the LAUSD is a partner, which is a behemoth, it's huge. Um, but we also have some small charter and magnet schools who are part of our partnership, um, health professional societies, and a, a host of national societies, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, et cetera. We also have faculty um, from Cedars, Charles Drew University, UCLA, Harbor, LA Biomed, and RAND. And then we have a partnership unit that sort of brokers conflicts um, and, and supports partnerships between um, community members and acad academic members, but also within each of those categories, particularly amongst the community <coughs> partners. I think one of the things that's been striking to me is the new partnerships that have developed amongst um, our community partners. And this just highlights where some of our community partners are. This was about a, a, a six months to a year old, but we're, we're spanning a lot of LA County. Um, we don't have a lot of East LA in part because of that other university that has its own, <laughs> has its own CTSA, but we're working with them. Um, and then this highlights kind of our, our four, four major institutions, Cedars, Charles Drew, UCLA, and Harbor. So now I'm going to um, describe some of the community-engaged activities that are going on within the CTSI, and I'll just there, there are three main categories that I'll describe today, but there are a lot of different projects that we're working on, and we'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, on our website, we actually have a lot of this information and some, some highlights from some of the projects. So uh, first is a hotspot analysis, which um, is looking at health risk and health resources in L.A. County. Um, the Healthy Community Neighborhood Initiative, which we describe as kind of community engagement in action, really trying to adhere to a lot of the principles of community engagement. And then there's some uh, partnerships with the public health departments, the DPH and DHS. So the hotspot analysis was um, led by uh, the late Rick Brown, um, uh, also David Zygmond, Jerry Kaminsky, and Ami Shaw. And uh, this group of investigators um, set about trying to understand chronic disease patterns and health services use at different levels of geography in Los Angeles County. And they, they link data from several sources. They, they have a lot of expertise amongst them. Uh, Jerry Kaminsky has done a ton of work and helped to develop the California Health Interview Survey, which was the brainchild of Rick Brown. Um, uh, David Zygmond has done a lot of work with OSHPA data, the Office of State Health Planning and Development data, which has data on hospital discharges and, and hospitals and uh, clinics in LA, uh, throughout California, and then US Census data. And the idea is to take these results and make them available to local governments and policymakers, community organizations, community residents to use for their own purposes. So I think we want to be um, infrastructure, but not just infrastructure for the university, but really infrastructure for the, the community as a whole and for the state potentially. So this is, this is, uh, these are some maps that I'll show you from uh, Ami Shaw. Uh, so this shows the LA County, um, uh, it's a map of LA County. It shows the eight uh, service planning areas from Antelope Valley down to the South Bay um, that are further divided into 26 health districts. And so they can look at data at a number of different geographic levels. 
Um, and I'm, giving, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the type of projects they've done or the types of data they've been able to, to present. Um, so they've looked at hypertension prevalence. So in LA County, the prevalence is about 45%, high, a little higher than the prevalence in California as a whole, which is 42%. Um, but you, what you see um, right off the bat is that, you know, so there are some spikes in a few of the sort of service planning areas. So in South LA, highest at 54%, South Bay, 50, uh, 48%, Metro LA, 50%, and San Gabriel Valley, 49%. But when you then look at data on emergency department and hospital admissions for hypertension, they're more than twice as high um, in the, South, uh, the um, South LA than they are in West, in West LA. So um, although the hyper, there wasn't a huge variation in prevalence of a hypertension, the consequences of hypertension, the comorbidity of, from hypertension is much more, it's exaggerated in South Los Angeles. And there's so many reasons for that. Now, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I really, um, we're all enthusiastic about is the idea isn't we're just gonna take this data and sit on it. We're gonna really try to use these data to delve deeper and really understand some of the disparities that we're seeing. Another, um, uh, another uh, analysis that they've done is looked at colorectal cancer screening um, by SPA. And as you can see, there are a couple of spas that have lower rates of colorectal cancer screening. Um, West LA, not surprisingly, is uh, higher than the others, but South LA and East LA, the lowest at 58 and 59% respectively. Um, but then when you look at mortality from colorectal cancer, it's much higher in South Los Angeles. And these cancers, uh, many of them are completely preventable. Um, you know, if you get early uh, colorectal cancer screening and early removal of, of polyps, um, uh, suspicious polyps, your risk of cancer goes down dramatically. So the other thing that they've been doing, in addition to sort of gathering these data, is presenting it in different areas. And then they, what they can do at that point is really drill down to smaller geographic data. So, so uh, geographic areas, rather. So what you see here are some of the places Ami Shah has presented these data. Um, uh, and presented not just general data for LA County or for the spa or for the health district, but really much more localized data. Um, and uh, it's actually been interesting because she's gotten tremendous feedback and tremendous interest from a whole range of stakeholders and policymakers. So in the San Gabriel Valley, for example, she did a presentation last fall um, where uh, we got feedback from them that they used the data that she'd presented and the links that she provided them to identify the communities within the San Gabriel Valley most affected by specific health disparities, which allowed them to better allocate healthcare resources. They also held a disparity summit and they used the data that she presented and that she provided them um, for, Dr. for um, Assemblyman Hernandez's staff uh, to address clinical and environmental contributors to diabetes, but then also think about strategies within the San Gabriel Valley for advocacy around health policies to mitigate um, disparities in diabetes because there's clear evidence that you can reduce rates of diabetes through diet and exercise. Um, and so progression from no, not having diabetes to diabetes is decreased dramatically up to 65% um, with diet and exercise for people who are at high risk. Um, uh, but also that once you have diabetes, there are strategies that can be adopted to really reduce your risk of poor outcomes from diabetes. So I think that the, um, they're getting this information on where where um, within their district diabetes is most prevalent and the people who are at highest risk, they can use that to help them set some health priorities and funding priorities. The other thing that we've been able to do, because this is a research institution, is actually get more money. And so we've used these analyses to get funding um, from NIH and from local foundations. So um, Dr. Roberto Vargas, who uh, is a, an investigator here at UCLA but has an appointment at Charles Drew as well, and Lark Galloway-Gilliam, who heads up community health councils, um, got an uh, NIMHD National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities grant 
for community-based participatory research to do a project on improving cardiovascular disease outcomes in South Los Angeles. As you see, rates of um, hypertension, hospitalizations, emergency department visits was quite high in that area. The downstream consequences are high rates of um, uh, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, hypertensive emergencies and urgencies, um, and stroke. And so the, um, their, role, their goal is to really link networks of community organizations and, um, and local clinics um, with, with the local hospitals to um, really try to mitigate some of the disparities that they observe. The other thing that we've done um, Jerry Kaminsky um, was able to get additional funding for the California Health Interview Survey. Um, so uh, when you go on to the, the, health, the, the CHIS website, you can actually download data for a spa um, and for, co for county. Um, you really can't access data on health district or smaller area. So what he was able to do with the data that, that uh, uh, David and Ami presented was to use that to get additional funding to try to drill down so within the next, he says, about 18 months, they'll have access, um, we'll be able to have access to these smaller areas on CHIS. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so <coughs> next steps with the hotspot analyses are um, <coughs> some of the interactive mapping that I mentioned. And then to link some of these data <clears throat> to cancer registries, mortality files, and other clinical data. <clears throat> and then I think long term, the goals are to track changes in communities and the community health in a more systematic and continuous manner. So what I'm going to do next is move on to another project that we've been working on for a few years. And excuse my frog voice, um, the HCNI or Healthy Community Neighborhood Initiative. And this is a community partnered study whose goal is to improve health and health care in one community in LA County. It's in South Los Angeles. Um, and it's a collaboration of the Los Angeles Urban League, Healthy African American Families, uh, and several members of the UCLA CTSI. Drew, um, Harbor, um, Cedars, and UCLA. So it emerges out of what was used to be called the 70 Block Project. And this is an, uh, a project, uh, uh, an area um, that's anchored by Crenshaw High School right here. You can see their football field. And um, through the Urban League. And they, the Urban League um, took a look at some of the local health stats. and really felt that you know, concentrating some effort in this area might have huge payoff. Um, this is an area that's about 95% African American or Latino. And it's a community that's characterized by significant but modifiable need. High levels of chronic disease, high levels of unemployment, um, the highest levels of foreclosure in LA County, and low high school graduation rates. So the Urban League has five, five things it focuses on. Um, education, health, housing, employment, and safety. And so what they were doing is really saying you can't, you can't see improvement in one without having the others improve simultaneously. You really need to have a multifaceted, um, make a multifaceted effort. And so what we did with the Urban League was to say, let's take a look at how, yeah, what the true health status of this community is. We had very high level data, but limited data at the household level. Um, we also wanted to get a sense of what not just the health status, but also all the social needs for this community were. So we, we took a sort of a three-pronged approach. Household surveys, neighborhood observations, and then community asset mapping. And we felt that this, part, this last piece was really critical. Too often, um, particularly in low-income and minority communities, uh, uh, investigators who come into the community often use a deficit model. So these are the, you know, and I, I sort of started off by telling you about all the negative things, all the modifiable needs in this community. But I think, that, you know, increasingly there's an emphasis on thinking about the assets that are, that are located within a community. And so we really tried to take that asset model as well. And a, a critical component of that is that Often there's sort of this insider-outsider perspective. As an insider, um, 
uh, you, you know about resources that people from the outside have no clue about. And as an outsider, you may see things and observe things that someone who's lived in that community for a very long time may no longer see or observe. So we felt it was really critical to have that back and forth between people who were within the community and those outside of the community. <clears throat> so I'm gonna focus a little bit on the, the household survey. So the goals there were to use this community partnered participatory, participatory approach to assess needs and community resources, and then over time collaborati collaboratively develop interventions to improve the health of the residents in the community. And so it is a community academic partnership, and so there are a lot of people at the table, um, many of whom are lay health workers, and many of whom are from um, academic institutions with years of years of education, and everyone has equal say. Um, and I think I just want to describe some of the key methods. So I think there was really one, one important element was collaborative development of all study protocols, forms, and instruments. Um, there were weekly meetings, um, community and academic events where these, th there were dis these discussions went on. And we also had sessions with invited community and academic experts. Um, a, another important element of this was mentoring. So there was mentoring of staff, community members, and students in all phases of the project. Um, the interview had several different elements I'll cover in another slide. And the physical exam also had a lot of elements. And then participants, we, we designed the study, what did, went through IRB, and participants received up to $50 in gift cards and also a community resource guide to thank them for their time. So the interview included demographic information, health behaviors, clinical characteristics, health care use, um, but also unmet social needs, employment, education, housing, and also a discussion of neighborhood problems and assets from the, the residents' perspectives. And then as part of the physical exam, and I'll tell you, the physical exam was conducted by lay health workers for the most part. And the phlebotomist who did finger sticks for blood spots was a community health worker who had been trained in phlebotomy. So, he did height and weight, waist circumference, blood pressure, heart rate. Uh, and then for people 50 and older, we did grip strength and chair stands. Now, these are often referred to as geriatric measures, but I started to take offense at that. Um, and so, but part of the reason we did this at the 50-year-old at the mark is because there's just there's some evidence of early um, aging, earlier aging in African-American Latino communities. And we wanted to get a sense of whether there were functional limitations at a, at a lower age. So these are some just early results from the first 65 participants. And what you see is that you have pretty high rates of uninsurance, particularly among the men. Um, blood, uh, high rates of high blood pressure, arthritis, chronic lung disease, um, more so among the women, even though men are much more likely to smoke. So a 50% rate of smoking among the men in the survey. And 9% had diabetes. Um, BMI was high, um, uh, you know, the mean was over 30, which is in the obese category, um, and um, uncontrolled blood pressure was also very high, 37, 36 percent. So these preliminary results are very, you know, um, it, it's not rocket science, it just suggests that these, are, these residents are at very high risk for cardiovascular and metabolic disease, and then very poor outcomes from these conditions. Um, so we, we're, we've linked, we're linking those data with the community asset mapping and the neighborhood observations to really get a broader picture of the community. Um, the other things that we did, though, that I think we view as really important outcomes from this project, in addition to the data that we collected, are community research training sessions. Um, we had five lay health workers trained to work in underrepresented communities. Two senior CTSI clinical staff um, were trained in community participatory methods. And we had six students participate in the research project so far. We're going to have about three more over the summer. Um, and then we've developed a community resource guide that we've been able to modify from existing resources. So, you know, it's this, this project suggests that the partnerships can really help to identify individuals, um, community, and uh, health system level factors that contribute to disparities, but then really thinking about how do you move forward from that. These are, we've identified this, these, um, these topics or domains um, with the help of uh, residents, but now we're trying to work on developing interventions with the help of some of those same residents. 
So now I'm going to move to some of the work that we're doing with the public health department. Um, and they sort of fall into three categories. Uh, you know, one of the things about the work that we're doing in the HCNI is that it's very intensive, but it's a very small area. Um, the impact may be big in that local area, and the potential, there's a potential to, to, to learn how to do this type of work in other settings. But um, given that LA County is as huge as it is, um, we felt uh, within the CTSI it was really important to make sure that we partnered with and had the same, had comparable priorities as the um, departments of public health and health services. And so we've spent a lot of time convening with um, Mitch Katz, uh, Jonathan Fielding, a lot of the people who work with them, many of whom have appointments here in the School of Public Health, which made it a lot easier to do so. But we've spent um, very many meetings really thinking about ways that the resources of an academic institution um, like the UCLA CTSI um, could be leveraged in order to um, help them achieve their goals and, and, and prioritize some of the conditions that they feel are important to prioritize. So we've actually done, uh, had three categories. One is some health impact assessments with the Department of Public Health. We've conducted partnered projects with DHS, Department of Health Services, and we now have this very new countywide project on successful aging that's just starting to get off the ground. So I'll just briefly describe these for you. Um, the HIAs are a real HIA is a process by which you evaluate the potential health benefits or health effects rather of a plan, project, or policy before it's built or implemented. The idea is that you figure out, you know, if you're going to put a freeway through um, a, an area, you want to know what are the likely long-term, short-term and long-term effects of building that freeway. If you're going to tear down something, what are the short-term and long-term consequences of doing that? Um, there, uh, one, one HIA that was done in San Francisco was um, what will happen if you put a supermarket in Bayview Hunters Point? which is a largely African-American, largely low-income community. And most of the people there said, this is a no-brainer. You, know, <laughs> you just need to put a supermarket. But they spent a lot of time doing the HIA. Um, uh, but I think the issue is a lot of times these take a long time. Um, and often, by the time you get the results of the HIA, you, the, the project's built. You've had to make a decision. The policymakers have had to make a decision. So what we've done is worked with um, um, the Department of Public Health on a, a project that they're, they've just started to try to streamline the process of HIAs to weeks and months rather than years um, through partnerships with academic institutions um, because they feel that the, oftentimes they don't have needed expertise. They may need, uh, they may need expertise in um, geography or expertise in you know, sort of toxic exposures or any of a number of things. And they don't have that expertise right sitting in the Department of Public Health waiting for them to ask them. So what they're trying to do with us, um, both us and the USC CTSI, is really identify kind of a cadre of people they can go to to say, hey, we need some information on X. Um, who do you have who could help us or who can point us in the right direction? So they've recently obtained funding from the Pew Charitable Trust, and they're waiting to hear about funding from the California Endowment to um, conduct two HIAs in LA County in the next year, but also develop infrastructure um, that will allow them to conduct future HIAs in a more streamlined fashion in partnership with us, with the USC CTSI, and maybe with other stakeholders within the community. The other thing that we've done is really try to provide some seed funding for um, projects that are of particular importance in the Department of Health Services. Um, Mitch Katz really recently came to LA from um, San Francisco to take over the Department of Health Services. And um, I think there's, uh, and with the Affordable Care Act um, being implemented, there are, there's a lot of change. You know, there's a huge sea change, I think, in the way healthcare is going to be delivered through the public health departments. And so, um, the, the, the imperative that we got from um, Mitch Katz and several others in the Department of Health Services was they really wanted to understand um, ways that DHS could improve care and increase the delivery of care um, without increasing costs and make that patient-centered care because that was going to be critical. They feel that a, a, a really important element of all of this is that they want to be able to keep the patients who are currently in their system in their system and provide better care and more care, but they, they have really limited funding. So 
we actually um, put out an RFA for this and awarded um, five uh, projects uh, on a broad range of topics, but these are all topics that could potentially have very big public health Im implications. So one is looking at teleretinal screening, particularly for patients with diabetes, um, and uh, it's a joint project with an investigator at UCLA and with the DHS. Um, another project is looking at psychiatric emergency room outcomes, which are highly variable across the public health system in, in Los Angeles. Um, another project is looking looking at asthma control um, and, and other outcomes among children who are transitioning from acute care when they're hospitalized at Harbor and go back to their primary care clinic, which is in the managed care setting. And, and often those handoffs are the most dangerous time because things get lost. Um, there's another project looking at obesity group visits for patients with diabetes at, at Charles Drew University. And then um, uh, a, a project specifically on HIAs to identify evidence-based programs to reduce school truancy. And this is of critical component, uh, um, importance both to DHS and DPH. Um, one of the strongest predictors of outcome is educational status. And graduating from high school um, is, is key to that. Unfortunately, among African American, and Latino, and Native American boys, those rates are vanishingly low in LA County. Um, and then finally, um, the last project I'll highlight is a new project. Um, for, uh, it's unfortunately gotten the name Big Audacious Goal. And so <laughs> I'm trying to get them to rename it, but I'm not having much success because I think people like saying it. Um, and so through this series of convenings, we said, you know, we're, we're going to work on small projects that are, provide seed funding for small projects that are important to DHS and DPH. But we also want to think on a grand scale. You know, you've got, um, you've got huge resources in this community, in, in, within LA County. You've got uh, tremendous potential to have a big impact. Um, how do we do that? What should we work on? You know, and we're taking our, um, really really trying to, to pick the brains of the folks at DPH and DHS about this. And so we met over a series of meetings. Martin Shapiro, uh, who's in general internal medicine, is uh, sort of leading these efforts. And so the, um, over about a, a three or four meetings, um, the leadership decided to really pursue the goal of successful aging in Los Angeles County. And the idea isn't that this is going to be limited to people 65 and older. You know, the best predictor of your health at 65 is your health at 40. And so really understanding um, how, you know, over the life course, um, physical, emotional, social well-being contribute to long-term health outcomes is part of this project. So they're, the domains that, that the group is looking at include social isolation, poor nutrition and lack of healthy food options, physical activity, mental health, substance abuse, prescription medication, misuse, polypharmacy, chronic disease management, the, built, the role of the built-in social environment, how, you know, whether you have a sidewalk or, you know, um, or uh, places to exercise, how that affects your ability to age successfully within LA County. So I hope with uh, maybe sometime in the next few years, I'll be able to come back and tell you more about how this, this project is proceeding. So I'm going to conclude here and just want to say that, you know, I think, I hope one of the things that's come across is that, you know, community and stakeholder engagement for translational research can take many forms, but um, all of those forms can potentially contribute very effectively to the goals of translational research. Uh, we're hoping that with some of the efforts we've described to you, we're taking some incremental steps towards addressing some of those translational research challenges that I described early on, making a difference in the health of the community, addressing the right problems, and successfully applying evidence-based research. Um, a key thing that we are really trying to maintain along the, uh, 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 throughout all the work that we're doing is really aligning the priorities of our research institutions with those of the key stakeholders, both in the community and in the community organizations and some of the big public health organizations to make sure that we address these challenges effectively. 
Um, I wanted to put in a plug for the Community Engagement and Research Program. We have a new consultation service that provides training in community-based research, health services research and implementation and dissemination research for investigators, but also for community partners. Um, and it provides kind of a matchmaking service, connecting investigators with community partners. Um, we've also connected some students with community partners. Uh, we also provide advice on study design, implementation, and guidance guidance on dissemination of research results. How do you take the data, whether it be your own data or data that's been, uh, uh, that, you know, that we've had for decades, how do you take that and synthesize it in such a way and present it so that it's meaningful? Um, to communities, to key stakeholders. So we have a, a consultation desk. You can also find us on the CTSI website. Um, and it, as I, uh, it does take a village, and these are uh, many of the people who, have wor who I work with and who uh, have contributed um, in uh, tremendous ways to, to the work that we're doing. So um, other members of the, the SERP and uh, Health Services Research Leadership Team, Keith Norris, Martin Shapiro, Loretta Jones, Dan Castro, and Ron Anderson, all the amazing community partners who have really stepped up and, and participated fully um, with no expectation of anything in return. Um, and the SERP staff who have been uh, just a, a tremendous, uh, working above and beyond the, the call of duty. The CTSI staff are terrific. And then um, the, uh, the SERP HSR and all the CTSI faculty who um, are just an amazing source of information. So thank you.